family today. Congratulations. You probably got the best seat in the house. Oh, yes. We're super happy for you. Uh, but before we jump into service today, we do have a few announcements. So first of all, um, we had last Friday, a couple days ago, a couple's night here at the church, which was incredible. And we're excited to throw a yes. singles night this coming Friday. So this is for anyone who is currently in a dating relationship or who is single as a Pringle and <laughs> wants to come and have a night where they can hang out with people that are in a similar season of life as, as them, as well as um, hear from Caleb and Chrissy. Yeah. I believe they're bringing a word that night. Oh, I'm sure. It's going to be fine. There's food. It's oh, 20 bucks a pop, so um, you can sign up for that on the Church Center app, but it'll be a great night. Yes, sure. we would love to see you there, yeah. so make sure that you sign up and that you register. And also, I wanted to let you guys know that we have a Four Sacramento project coming up. If you didn't know, we do outreaches the second Saturday of every month. And this month, it lands on the 12th. Hey. And so we love this. We love just loving on our city and then doing it together as a church family fun. as well. And so if you're interested, you can also register for that on the Church Center app. Yep. And we will be helping out Yolo Food Bank. And Such so make sure, make sure you come on out. We would love to see you there. Yes. And then also, if you have not been water baptized yet, if you want to take that next step of faith, in your walk with God, you can do so on May, March, March, what month are we in? We're in March, 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 yeah. March 20th <laughs> here at the church. Uh, you can sign up for that on the church center app and let us know what service you'd like to be baptized in. But we are really excited to do baptisms. And if the weather's good, we might be able to do it outside Ooh, on the porch again. So I love it'll that. be super fun. Yes. So definitely sign up. Yes. And if you didn't know, we are in the Lenten season Ooh. and we've been going through 40 days of decrease as a church. We're doing devotionals in the morning. We also have a journal and a book that you can yeah. follow along with. And so we're in the middle of that right now. And so if you're interested in joining us, you can get a book and also a journal in the lobby at church right after service, before yep. service, whatever it, uh, whatever works for you. And so we're super excited. I know that we have taken a lot from this 40 totally. days of decrease, and I'm sure that you will too. And so get those books, get those journals. We'd love to hear what the Lord is speaking to you through that. Absolutely. And that's all we got. So let's go ahead and jump on into service. morning church family anybody come to worship Jesus this morning all right come on stand on your feet let's worship the Lord because this is the day that the Lord has made and we choose to rejoice and be glad come on and clap those hands this morning come on. Oh 
I don't understand cards well, and I said this last service, and I might have even messed it up, but whatever, nobody judged me. But in the game of cards, there's these things like, you'll say something like, I raise you up, right? Which means it's like, this is greater than what was before. See, sometimes, when we talked about this first Wednesday, man, y'all got to make it out first Wednesday, it's been going crazy. But when we talk about raising the stakes and raising up higher, that means it's greater than what was before. See, the enemy likes to make you feel that your problem is too big for our big and amazing and awesome God. And at the end of the day, it's really really easy to sing about, but it's harder to walk out. But do you know we can do better when we're, as a community, when we stand together, we say, hey, no longer are we going to hold and be held down by our problems. No longer is our problems going to be too big. We're going to tell our big God about our little problem. We're going to raise a hallelujah in the midst of my situation when it feels like I can't make it, when it feels like I'm going to lose, when it feels like I can't do it. I just raise a hallelujah. I say, God, I trust you. God, in every circumstance, I will be content. So listen up.
take a second just to think about that. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. I'm a son of the most high. I'm a daughter of the king. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. I am not the lies that have been spoken over me year after year. I am not the lies. No longer am I the lies in the name of Jesus. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen. I am chosen. is something to celebrate. That is something to celebrate. Something to celebrate. You know, there's this song I want to sing when I go to heaven. I would love to have the opportunity to stand before God and be like, hey God, I got this song that we sang at the church and it's just talking about how much we love you. How many just love Jesus? And I can't wait to see him. But there's no more worry, no more issue, no more cancer, no more sickness, no more death. When I see him, I just want to sing to him and say, Jesus, on behalf of me and my family, me and the body of Christ, we love you. If you love Jesus, just rest your hands up right now. Things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Yeah. Things that we had were dead. Yeah. We are breathing again. You close yourself to shine. church the anthem song say Jesus come on sing this to your father not to your neighbor sing it out
when we were down his love never quits he rescued us from the trampling foot because his love never quits he takes care of us every time we're in need because his love never quits it ends with saying thank God who he does it all for his love never quits oh this is the good news of the gospel that we came in here and maybe it's so hard for us to sing Jesus I love you because you know you you know your flaws you know your mistakes you know your pains you know the things that nobody knows God knows you most and he's still the one that in spite of everything his love never stops pursuing us this is the good news this is why we worship it's not because we do it on our own but because when we've got nothing left He reminds us that he knows us and he grabs us by the hand and he says, I'm not going to fail you. I don't know who in here needs to hear that. He's not going to fail you. No, 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 you need to hear that. He's not going to fail you. He's not going to fail you. He sees you. He sees your needs. He sees your brokenness. He sees the times when you're weeping and nobody else sees burdens. He sees the lack. But he's not going to fail you. This is where we place our hope that there's a cross in an empty tomb that Jesus went to for you and for me to remind you that he won't fail you yet. Can I tell you how many times I've woke up and said, God, I don't think I can do it anymore. And to be honest, there are days where I don't even know how I get my foot in front of the other. But when I read that scripture, I'm reminded it's because He won't stop pursuing me. He won't stop loving me. I don't know who needs to hear that, but his love, it's unrelenting. This is why we, this is a church. It's not because we have a great word and a great God and a great, no, no, the reason why we have a great God is simply because, and I think we've lost this if I'm honest, the reason why we're even here right now is because he loves you enough to pursue you in the midst of everything. He loves you. He loves, you need to get a hold of this truth. This is why we lift our hands. This is why we come here every day because the hope is, is that even if everything has been hell, if his love is still for me, nothing else can defeat me. This is what we build on. So Jesus, we fix our eyes on you and even though we sing these songs and it's our devotion and our affection poured out on your feet. 
we realize that we only come to your feet because you love us because you pursue us. You're the God who does everything exceedingly and abundantly. And God, for the one in here that they are having a hard time seeing that, I pray that these words would soak into their soul. God is able. He's able. He's able to meet you right where you are. He's able to meet you where you think you can't go. He's able to meet you in your brokenness, in your loneliness, in your despair, in your depression. God is able. He's able to do exceedingly and abundantly greater than you can ask, than you can think, than you can imagine. The fight is not over because his love never stops. God, we want to take this moment to pause and just say we're thankful. Even like the end of that psalm says, thank God who does it all. Take a moment, just thank him. Just thank him. Come on out loud, lift up your voice. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you that you're able. Thank you that there's still reason to hope. Come on, tell him right now, church. Lift up your voice. God, thank you that you're able still. Thank you that you're a provider. Thank you that you're my protector. Thank you that you go in front of me and you stay behind me. Thank you that there's no weapon formed against me that shall prosper. Thank you that in the name of Jesus, there is still hope because of an empty tomb. That goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. That even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of darkness, I won't fear evil, for you are for me. Come on, remind yourself, God, thank you. God, thank you. God, thank you. Thank you for the truth of your word, but thank you for the grace of your love. We just say we're grateful. We're just saying that we need you. God, don't let us leave these moments the same way we walked into them. We want to know you for who you really are. So we take these moments. We surrender everything. Just to be reminded of that truth. You are not going to fail me. You're not going to fail me. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, can we give it up for God? Come on, can we give it up for Jesus? You can take a seat for just a moment. Sam, I never know how to transition out of these moments. Like, can you guys come back? Uh, We can do this all day. Um, Man, are you grateful for the hope that you have in Jesus? That's all we got, friends. You know, um, before I got to, there's a service order. I got to move through this, even though I don't know how to. Um, Listen, if you've been coming here for any amount of time and you've been, not just worshiping with, with song, but, but with your finances. Listen, that honors God. The Bible says, give, give cheerfully with a joyful heart. And I believe that God just does something so powerful through that. Um, you've, you've seen a lot of the things that we do. I don't need to talk about it. But just the fact that this church, we just had partners party. And you guys have been so generous over the, the years. Like every year, I want you to know this. If you were here for partners party, every year, this church has had a raise in finances. We've, the church has gotten more generous has become more willing to be used by God and said, I'm going to give everything I've got. But it hasn't made us more wealthy. My paychecks have not gone up, and it's because they don't need to. You know why? Because there's more people sitting in these chairs that are receiving the hope of Jesus because you're just saying, God, you can use whatever I've got. Now, in a moment, we're going to show a video of the Convoy of Hope and what they're doing over in Ukraine right now. And I want you to know that, like, the generosity that's happening in this place, like, we talked about last year was a year of overflow. Like you guys might not ever get a glimpse of what's really happening through our church, but we're talking about being a generous church. I literally had some VPs and principals call me last week like, hey, we want to partner with Project, like the, in the entire school district. We want to partner with Project Church to give to Convoy of Hope for the people in Ukraine. People that, listen to this, students and faculty that might not even know Jesus are getting a hold of the fact that generosity can change things. And I believe that God has given us the resources to listen. If God is stirring on your heart to give, come on, let's, God will never, never take from you something he can't give back to you. And when we open up our hands, it's just a a sign of saying, God, I release it to you. But man, you can grab things still. God will still give to you. So in a moment, they're going to show the video of Convoy of Hope, how you can partner with us in the Church Center app. You can give. Um, But watch this video. But let me pray. God, thank you so much. God, thank you that you've given us everything we need. God, even for the one that's in this place that maybe feels like they don't have what they, what they need or what they want to be generous, God, I pray that you'd remind them that even when, where it might feel like lack, God, I think that you're more impressed by the faith of those who give when they feel like they can't because I believe that you have so much that you're holding for them. 
So I pray that you'd bless the hands and the heart of the giver today. And I pray that you'd use what they sow, God, to continue to impact and change this generation. But I pray that you'd also return the favor, God, and show them the favor of God is on them. And when they are generous, that you are a God who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly. So God, I pray you'd bless this house today as we give. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm Ethan Forhats with Convoy of Hope. Right now, a team from Convoy is on the ground in Poland working to aid Ukrainian refugees. We know that more than a million people have already fled Ukraine, and more than three quarters of those have escaped to Poland. The scenes are heartbreaking. Tens of thousands of people, mostly women and children carrying suitcases, waiting at train and bus stops for transportation. Our team has been struck by the dazed look on the precious faces of so many children. Convoy of Hope is working to bring relief to these families, providing food, water, shelter, hygiene kits, baby kits, and medical supplies. We are currently working in six countries in the region, offering hope to those who feel hopeless. You can join us as we act as the global church, reaching out to those who are suffering to bear one another's burdens. We ask for your support and we ask for your prayers. Pray that Convoy is able to navigate the situation wisely and effectively to truly show people the love of Jesus. And remember to continue to pray for the people of Ukraine. Thank you. Welcome to Project Church. We're so glad you came to be with us today. No matter where you're at in life and faith, you're welcome here. If this is your first time, we'd love to connect with you. Simply text the word PROJECT to 97000. We'd love to send you home with a gift box. Here at Project Church, we believe generosity is our privilege and giving is a part of our obedience and worship to God. The easiest way to give is to download the Church Center app and set up a one-time or recurring gift. When you give, you enable more people to find life and freedom in Jesus locally and globally. Thank you for your generosity. If you're part of our online campus, you'll find all the links you need for prayer, community groups, or simply just connecting with us in the description of this stream. Thanks again for being here, and be sure to bookmark projectchurch.com to find out more ways you can connect and plug into the many communities we have here. Enjoy the rest of the service. We pray God speaks to you through the message and community here at Project Church. Good morning, Project Church. We are so glad to have you guys here for our second service. I'm glad that you guys can make it in. I heard there was a bit of a traffic jam, but look, we have a full room. So incredible. All thanks, right. for, thanks for being thanks patient for being and coming here, here today. Still. Yeah, exactly. Did anybody have problems with parking this morning? No. Oh. All right, a couple hands, the honest couple? few. Yeah. God is going to bless you for that. You're still here. Yes, that's... <laughs> That's the Lord's favor in your life also for those of you that didn't have parking right. issues. Well, my name is Alex. This is Sam, as you know, and we are just so glad to have you guys here at church this morning. I mean, you guys came ready to worship. You guys came ready to press in. And so I am so excited for the rest of this service. But we do have a couple of announcements for you guys. First, if you are a first time guest here, I want to let you know that you are our VIP. And so again, if you're a first time guest, we have an incredible team that just wants to welcome you, get to know you. And so before you leave today, make sure that you turn to the left um, outside of the auditorium. And again, we have a great team that has some gifts for you guys, one including coffee, which I know all of us love coffee in this room. And so we have coffee for you. We have a cool t-shirt and we'd love just to see you guys get plugged into Project. And speaking of which, a great way to get plugged in is by attending our Blueprint course not to be confused with our coffee shop yeah. <laughs> but our course is just a way for you guys to learn more about project church how we function as a church our different teams and things like that and it also offers us an opportunity to get to know you guys as well there's a spiritual gifts test it's super good um, it's right after our nine o'clock service and so next week or if you have a time within the next few months that you want to attend that make sure that you come to our 9 a.m service and then blueprint will be right after again just a really great way for for you guys to get hugged into project church and for us to get to know you as well yeah a couple other things really quickly, not going to say a lot about it. We had couples night on Friday, um, which was for our, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was for all the <laughs> engaged and married people. Now listen, we got one for everybody else. So we're like, hey, we kind of excluded those who are dating and single. We got a night for you. Real quick, raise your hand if you're uh, if you're single and here ready to mingle. Don't be afraid. Come on, look, oh, look there around. We go, there we go. Look around. Yep, there's yep, some, yep. There's some people <laughs> waving their hands. All right, somebody like, right, yes, here, right here. Me. Okay. Listen, 
Uh, there's a night for, for the singles and for those who are dating in the room where you get to come and get encouraged about how to be, you know, single really well and honoring God, but also how to date really well. Yes. So that's this Friday night, March 11th. Register in the Church Center app. All the information you need is in there, but it's filling up quickly, so make sure you RSVP your spot. Absolutely. I also want to let you guys know that one of our blueprints here is servanthood, our calling. And so we try to give you guys opportunities to serve the church, but also to serve our community. And so something that we have is four Sacramento projects that we have every second Saturday of the month. You may have known them as Hope Projects or Hope Days. Now they're for Sacramento. Same same mission, same calling to bring hope to our city. But we want to make it very clear that we're bringing um, hope to Sacramento and to all of the areas that we're in. And so this coming Saturday, we are doing a food distribution with Yolo County Food Bank. You need to get there. We've heard some incredible testimonies of our church members continuing to serve even beyond our second Saturday. And then even people from Yolo Food Bank coming to Project Church because of our partnership. And so we love um, touching our community and bringing hope to our community in Jesus' name. Yeah, busy week, busy things, a lot going on. But last thing, next Sunday, March 13th, water baptism. If you've never been baptized, or maybe you have, you're like, hey, it's time that I rededicate myself to the Lord. You can go to the uh, Church Center app and register. We're going to do it both during the 9 o'clock and the 11 o'clock service right here in the sanctuary. Water will be warm. I understand it's cold out there. Water is going to be warm. We got shorts, towels, t-shirts, everything you need. Just sign up on there. It'll be one of the greatest decisions you can ever make. Now, we're already a minute over, so I got to say one last thing before Pastor it's Lauren an comes out. One. As you guys know, Pastor Lauren's last message that he's going to preach here for now is today. He's transitioned to plant a church out in Tampa Bay, Florida. Not sure why that's where the Lord called him. The Buccaneers lost, and I don't know if he knows that. <laughs> but he's going to Tampa Bay. And uh, while we are so sad to see him leave, we are excited for what's next. So can we do something? If he's deposited anything in your life, he's ever encouraged you. If he's been a person that you've leaned on at any point. When Pastor Lauren comes out here, can we stand up, give him an ovation, love on him, and let him know that we're going to miss him and give him a well project send off. But here, here's the thing, here's the thing. I didn't say this. Last message, he will be here next week. So we get to double dip. But let's show him some love today. Can we do that? All right, let's go. guys. Y'all are the best, the greatest. You guys are so cool. I love you all so much. I want to just go give everybody a high five and a hug right now. Y'all are the coolest. Man, Project Church is the best. Uh, Seven years ago, we got on this stage, uh, not this stage, but the stage of Project Church, and we're like, hey, we're here. We're coming to plant a church, my wife and I, and we only had one kid then, and now we got four. Be fruitful and multiply. Uh, But man, so much has happened. I have so much emotion right now. Y'all have no idea. Last week I had so much that I like, it it came out like a robot. That's what I felt like I was. I had so much that like nothing came out. And they're like, what do you have to say, Lauren? I was like, I'm leaving. I got so, that's all I said. Uh, But so much gratitude. Um, for this church and for the Coles. Um, I, uh, really cool story. And, um, I, I started in ministry under Caleb's grandpa. He, he, I remember I was like a youth ministry guy. He wasn't the youth pastor, but I was in the youth ministry office and the, at the church, his, his grandfather, Glenn Cole took over and he walks into the office and I was 19 years old. I'd only been saved a couple of years and Marcy remembers because Marcy was the first person I actually ever met in, in Sacramento when I moved here. I was 18 years old. I had no, no, knew nobody. And all I knew was like, hey, I'm gonna, I love Jesus and I want people to know about him. And uh, anyways, I, I was sitting there. You, I had no idea what was going on. I liked this chick that was at the church. Her name was Veronica. Uh, but I had no idea what, was, uh, what my future was. I was kind of figuring things out. And his grandpa came into my office or the office and was like, hey, I want to hire you as a youth pastor. And I was like, for real skis? 
And I didn't say that, but I said that in my heart. I was like, are you, do you know, like I'm only 19 years old and the kids I'm, I'm trying to lead have been saved longer than, than I have. They know more about the Bible than, than I do. Are you, you sure? But I didn't say that, but that was going through my head. And, um, I just feel so connected to the Cole legacy, uh, being able to work for, cause, cause two years after that, um, Caleb came to work for his grandfather and I got to uh, meet him. And I remember thinking, uh, be, I was, remember being so excited to, uh, to have a mentor that I wanted to look up to and, uh, that I needed in that season, uh, for so, for so many reasons. And uh, I remember being excited and, and expecting to be mentored, expecting to, uh, to be encouraged and to have someone in my corner rooting for me, if, but I wasn't expecting a friend. And, uh, that is really what, I've been able to, to find in Caleb and Chrissy, and we've been able to find in Caleb and Chrissy. And uh, so much just by osmosis has rubbed off. Uh, not that he would take me through a lesson every day, but it was actually uh, at that church that uh, I, would, I remember thinking, okay, what do we do next? Uh, he's now like overseeing me as a youth pastor th- at that time. And, um, and I remember we would go to uh, sweet dozen donuts. Come on, somebody. Je- yes. They're right there. The best donuts. It, I, I'm, you all are going to have to bring me donuts in Tampa. Um, but we would go there before we even really knew the, the cabs and, um, and we would just, he would just, we just chop it up. And I found a friend when I was expecting a mentor and that has been so incredibly life-giving. Uh, so Caleb and Chrissy are on a little getaway right now, but next Sunday they'll be here. But can we give it up for Caleb and Chrissy? Such incredible people that have had vision that has blessed me. Uh, selfishly, I want to say more than anybody because I've gotten to, to be pretty close to them. But I know they've all, you've all experienced the blessing of, of having incredible pastors. There's not a lot of churches with pastors like them. I don't think there ever, there are. Uh, I used to always, like years ago, I'd be like, Caleb, why do you step all the way forward? You all know what I'm talking about. Why, you're going to like fall. And then I'm like, dude, why do you do that? And what do I do after, after like just not even thinking about it? I'm up here preaching with my toes hanging off the edge. Uh, I love them. Uh, last, next Sunday is our last Sunday on staff. Today is my last message uh, preaching here for a while. I want to be back uh, Caleb said he'd have me back. So I, I got family here biologically, but also I got family here in this room. So I will be back. Um, real quick, 40 days of decrease, grab your book. Uh, we are going through this season of Lent, uh, 40 days leading up to Easter. Um, and it's decreasing. It's thinning our lives to thicken our communion with God. And there's a devotional. We send out a video every day. So I want to encourage you to grab the book for 10 bucks, and also the devotional journal for free so you're applying things. We fast something different each day. It's very powerful. Check that out. But a lot of y'all have asked me, like, what's the plan? Um, when are we moving? Why are we moving? Um, we felt God just give us a crazy piece about this. And it is a very crazy thing to do. But uh, you're looking at a crazy person, just, just a little crazy uh, and we just felt so much peace about it. We love that area and just wanted to take a big leap of faith. And so some have asked like, when's it going, when's it going down? How's it going down? Who's on the team? And so far we have six people on the team. Their names are Lauren, Veronica, Charlotte, Holland, Joanna, and Lincoln. If you want to join the team, the signups are in the back. I'm just kidding. But seriously, um, but a lot, the next Sunday is our last Sunday. They are taking an offering for you. A lot of people have asked if you want to be able to contribute. That would mean the world to me. But absolutely more than that. I know people say that, but absolutely more than that. I covet your prayers. We, and here's how you can pray for me. Yes, pray for the provision. Pray for our marriage. Pray for open doors. Pray for. But here's what I am requesting prayer for. Is for you to pray for me that I would trust God more. That is the biggest thing I need in my life, is that I would trust God more, that we would trust God more. And so many of you have came came up to me saying, hey, how can I support you? That is how, that is my biggest need right now, is that I would trust God, that I have a deeper dependency on him. 
Today is, uh, we're jumping back into the book of Mark, and it's, this, this passage is kind of crazy. It's kind of a weird one to be super real with you to, to like finish on because it's kind of sad. It's kind of deep, and it's not like I was kind of picturing like this joyful, like happy message, and, and it does have some resolution to the joy part of it, but it is very deep. I'm talking about how Jesus processed pain. So right as we're finishing up this book of Mark, we've been going through verse by verse, the book of Mark for three years. And this is absolutely my favorite series. So I'm also excited. I get to close it out on this, but I want to talk about how Jesus processed pain a little bit. And this idea that pain can propel you forward towards your purpose. That God can use the things that hurt for his purposes. And that often the things that pain you the most, the things that hurt you the most, the greatest pains in your life, God will redeem for his purposes. And that's what I, I see as I look at this passage. And I, and I want to share my story real quick um, in, in kind of my journey. Some of you all know this, but I didn't, I didn't grow up in church. And I grew up in a place where I felt loved both my parents, but uh, around the age of 12, I found out my dad suffered from this mental disorder called bipolar disorder. And I started seeing my dad, who, who I know loved me, that I felt loved by him, turn into someone else. And how a 12-year-old is supposed to po- process that isn't, there, there isn't a formula for it. And I didn't process it well, that I, not that I, anyone expected me to process it well, but I started, I started get running towards the wrong things as I would probably expect myself to do. And then eventually I found myself saying, would anybody really care if I was gone? I wrote that in my journal uh, that I bought from Walmart, this little spiral bound notebook that I write stuff in. And I wrote, would anybody care if I was gone? I wasn't really suicidal. I didn't have a plan, but that was just my honest thought that came up. And I remember writing that so distinctly because a little bit after that, I, I was, I was kind of figuring out my options. Okay, what am I trying to do? What am I, how am I trying to solve this problem in my life of feeling like what's, what's the point of life? What's the purpose? And then I thought maybe God could help because I've always kind of been like, yeah, of course God is real. Like that just makes sense to me uh, for the most part, at least. I got a lot of questions still, but yeah, God's real. I don't know what that means at least. And, uh, but of course he's real. So like, where do they talk about God? They talk about a church. So I invited myself to church. I found out what time church was. Uh, You're supposed to invite people to church, just an FYI, but nobody was inviting me. So I was like, dude, I'll invite myself. I don't need an invite. I'll just do this myself. So I I rode my bike out to the church and I found myself like figuring out, like I didn't grow up in church. So like people were like, I just watched what people did. People were raising their hands. So I was like, like this. You know, you just feel super weird. I don't know. I was like, that's what everybody else is doing. I'm doing it. I didn't know what it meant. They were singing the songs. I was like, what the heck does that mean? Okay, I'll say it. Uh, because I was desperate for God. And at the end, I listened to a dude talk for a while. And I was like, okay, I didn't really understand the vast majority of that. But at the end, he said, hey, anybody want prayer? Come on up to this front area place. And I was looking around. Nobody was going up. I was like, what are you? what's wrong with all you people? Like, isn't the purpose of church to, like, get close? No, none of y'all need prayer. Wow. I, and I didn't even care. I'm like, I don't even know you people, but like, that's why I'm here because I need Jesus pretty bad. I'm pretty sure God could help me. So, yo, I, I don't care what y'all think about me. I'm marching myself up there and came up and then the guy was like, what do you need? I'm like, bro, I'm here for Jesus. What's, what's, what's this all about? Right. And I'm not going to tell you that boom, like God removed all my pain and took me out of the depression. But I will say that started the process of healing and me moving out of depression into joy, out of freedom, out of bondage into freedom. And I experienced something that was so real to me. Nobody needed to to tell me like, hey, you need to invite your friends to church because I just felt it. I went back onto my campus because I happened in the summertime. And then as a sophomore stepping on on my campus for the first time uh, after knowing Jesus and experienced the life and the freedom that's only found in him, I started looking at everybody different. Every person I saw, I looked at them and I was like, man, I wonder, I wonder how many kids are going through something just as bad or worse as I was just a month ago. And I started seeing through this filter that like, man, I, I have the solution. Not I am the solution, but I can point people to the solution that is Jesus. 
And I started just becoming passionate. And there was a lot of rough patches through high school. But I started just becoming passionate and realizing God did this in my life. I want him to do that in other people's lives. And I started just going into the cafeteria at lunchtime and just looking for kids that were sitting by themselves. And going out and sharing, sharing, listening to them, what's their story, and then sharing my story. Once I got a license and once I, I bought a 1995 Isuzu Rodeo, I would pile in many kids as I could into the car and take them to youth group and be like, y'all need Jesus. And then once senior year rolled around, I was like, they, were, they, they asked you this question, what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do? And I was like, I was thinking this, like, can, can I just, I, I like doing this. I like bringing people to Jesus. Can I just keep doing that? Like, I don't know if that, that's a thing, but sign me up for that. And uh, I, I, that's exactly what I did. I kind of connected the, with the last story of me coming, moving to Sacramento, not knowing anybody and getting hired by Caleb Cole's grandfather, Glenn Cole, and me being able to serve uh, almost seven years in, the, in that church and meeting my wife there. And then building that relationship with Caleb and then uh, them launching Project Church and then me coming in year one into into uh, Project Church and being able to launch the West Sacramento campus, which I'm so grateful for that season. And that brings us to right here. That's like basically the synapse story of my life story. But I bring that up because I look back at the pain that caused. And I I remember in, in that moment, I was like, man, I really wish this wouldn't have happened. Like, I really wish my dad didn't suffer from this disorder called bipolar disorder. I really wish my parents were still together. I really wish my my dad didn't go in and out of prison more times than I could count. I really wished I had that stability as a 12-year-old as I needed some stability and wasn't feeling so insecure all the time of what is going to happen, where are we going to live next, and what is going down next week. But I look back and I see how we serve a God that takes the things of that, that are intended for evil, the things that pain us, and he turns it around and redeems it for his purposes. I want to encourage you that the painful things that we walk through have a purpose. And, and this is a word that I feel very distinctly for people that have looked back on painful things that you've had in your life. And God wants to say, you will no longer look back on those things and say, I wish it didn't happen. Because I used to say, I wish this didn't happen. And I look back and I have gratitude in my heart because I see how God turned it around. I am grateful, as hard as that is to say, I am grateful that that painful situation happened to my life because I wouldn't be who I am and I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for the pain and for God turning it around. So here's the, the, the reason why this is so important for every single person and this message absolutely applies to everyone and it's absolutely critical is because pain is unavoidable. Jesus actually promises pain. And this is what I was talking about like, coming in with the feel-good message, talk about the promise of peace, the promise of provision, God's good, God loves you, promise all, those are all true. But also, we don't really talk about that Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. When you follow me, especially when you follow Jesus, you will experience persecution. And also the word there is tribulation. You will experience pain. It is part of the sin entering the world. Thanks a lot, Adam and Eve, but it's the process that we are in that we will experience pain. It is unavoidable. So here's the common denominator with everybody in this room. We've all been through pain. But here's also the common denominator in this room that applies to everyone, is that God has promised that he will take that pain. He will take the things that have pained us, the things that have hurt us deep. And I believe that the greatest pains in our life will become the things that propel us to our greatest purpose, that he redeems them. And, and as we look at this, I think it is critical because I believe they are intended to propel us, those painful things we walk through are intended to propel us forward. But how we process it, because this is talking about how Jesus processed pain, that is determined, that determines whether the painful things will propel us or paralyze us. No one taught me how to process pain as 12 years old. No, and I didn't expect anybody to. But how we process pain 
is a game changer because it's either going to push us forward or paralyze us. Push us forward, propel us towards the purpose that he has for us and be the things that God uses in the greatest degree or it's going to be the thing that you attach yourself to and it paralyzes you and holds you down and you find identity in your pain. This is how Jesus processed pain. It was one of the greatest pains imaginable. And when we talk about pain, I'm not actually talking about physical pain, although that was part of the cross, crucifixion, and agonizing, unimaginable pain. But it actually, the physical pain, even though how agonizing it was, even though the, the nails in his hands and his feet, the crown of thorns, even though the flogging, whipping pieces of his flesh out of his body, and in him dying, not from blood loss, but from asphyxiation, which means the lack of oxygen, because in order to breathe, you have to push yourself up with the nails through your feet and push your to get a breath, and eventually you just run out of energy, and you have to decide when your last breath is going to be, because your body needs oxygen. You have to say, I don't have the energy. I don't have it in me, and so this is my last breath. The unimaginable physical pain while it's so great still didn't match didn't even hold a candle to the internal pain that jesus was experiencing and that is why he cries out father if this any other way take this cup from me so when we're talking about pain i'm not just talking about the physical pain but the internal pain is far worse as we all know and that's what i'm talking about it doesn't take a psychology to, to, to understand that all the problems of our life, addictions and insecurities, are because we didn't process pain well. And so, so what we're talking about is looking to the wonderful counselor, looking to, to Jesus, the author and finisher, and how he processed pain. And I want to read this passage, and I want you to ask God to speak to you from his word, because I'm not... I'm not the mouthpiece of God. I'm not the one that's got, God wants to speak directly to you through his word. I just want to be the director. I just want to point you to the truth. I am not the truth. I just want to point you to the truth. The context of this passage real quick, and then we'll jump in, is this was his last days. We're talk, talking, calling this the finisher because he's the author, the finisher, and he said, it is finished. And so this is leading up to that moment on the cross. This is Thursday night, and he's with his disciples, and we read about how he brought them into the Garden of Gethsemane. And we ask the question, why did Jesus beg to not go to the cross? Because this is how you, this is how you read scripture. This is, how, this is a pro tip, is ask questions. Like, you ever read scripture, and you're like, I'm not sure what that's all about. Ask the questions. Ask the question. I write them down. Ask the questions to God. There's a bunch of tools that you can use. One of them is called blueletterbible.com or .org. It might be Blue Letter Bible. Type it into Google, and you can find the Greek words, the Hebrew words. And another great free commentary is netbible.com. And I'll, I'll often, those are just free resources that you can dig deeper. If you have questions, ask God that in prayer and look to the sources, look to research that is and tools that can help you understand it better. And why I ask this question, that's how I'm bringing you the points today of what I feel like God's spoken to me is digging down into the question, why would Jesus ask his father and beg his father not to go to the cross? I believe there's two things. One, it highlighted his humanity because Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully man. That means he experienced pain. That means he experienced the physical pain. That was real. That wasn't just like, oh, he's God, he's Superman, he doesn't feel it. He was fully God, but he was fully man. So it highlighted his humanity, that the intensity, and then that's the second thing, is it highlighted the intensity of the pain. It's unimaginable, unimaginable what the Son of God said, if there's any other way, please take this from me. And that's what I believe today, stepping into God's plan, stepping into God's purpose means stepping through the pain and walking through the pain. I believe often we're taught uh, as, as children to avoid the pain. And then, then, then we interpret this, this philosophy, if you will, that pain means a sign, is a sign to turn around. I want to I 
destroy that argument and destroy that belief that pain is not a sign to turn around. It is not a sign that you're doing the wrong thing. Pain involved is a part of the process of stepping into what God's called you to do. And so pain, we have to recognize, it's like, how do we process it? Let's look at what Jesus said and what he did. Mark 14, 32 through 42 says this, and they went to a place called Gethsemane and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter, James, and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, that the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and he found them sleeping. And he said, Peter, Simon, you are asleep. Could you not watch for one hour? Watch and pray that you might not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were very heavy and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said, are you still sleeping and taking rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. I want to pray real quick. Would you bow your heads with me and pray? Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for going to the cross. Thank you that your word is divinely inspired to to speak to hearts, to divide between bone and marrow. It is living and active and, and determines and can see and can search out the motives of our heart. So I pray that you would search the motives of our heart and bring out truth. Bring out healing. I pray that we would draw closer to you. Speak to us, God. That is a posture of our heart. I see a church right now that is hungry for you. I have sensed it, especially the last few weeks, God. So as we hunger for you, we hunger to hear from you, God. So let me decrease. Let it not be my words, but your words. And we thank you for what you're doing in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Here's what I want to, want to do really quick. And then I want to close in prayer and believe God. I really believe God has something, something deep. For a lot of people, there's been some heavy things put on my heart uh, amidst all of the emotions. I've been praying a lot about this day, this moment, and really believe God wants to do that. So I want to make room for that. But I want to simply ask the, uh, look at these, uh, this perspective, that our perspective on pain will determine if it paralyzes us or propels us, or propels us, like how we process pain and the way we look at pain. Like, is it something we run from? Is it something we hide? Is it something we sweep under the rug? As I said, pain is actually promised. It's unavoidable. It will happen. But he says, take heart. I've overcome the world. I'm going to be with you. And as I look at this passage, I could take this passage a lot of ways. This is not a full exposition of this passage because there's a lot of other aspects of this passage. But I want to zero in on how Jesus processed pain. So follow me with that. Here's what I learned is that Jesus is that processing pain means inviting community into your journey. It means that you're not doing this alone. See, Jesus, even Jesus modeled this. And he said, where are my boys at? Like, we're going. I need you. We're going into this garden. I need you to pray for me. He said, pray for me. And then, then his, his closer ones, Peter, James, and John, I need you. And even though he, they failed him, even though they couldn't stay awake, even though they didn't understand, even though they didn't empathize to the degree and they fell asleep and they weren't, weren't catching what Jesus was saying and they weren't fo- following the spirit, even though your community may have failed you, you need to invite community along your journey because you are not intended, you are not purposed to walk through pain alone. And that is a beautiful statement. God looked at the world and he's like, man, this is good. This is good. You remember the creation, created land. It's good. He created birds. It's good. Created the fish. Good. Mammals. Good. Mankind. Good. But it is not good. He looked at man. And he said, it is not good that he be alone. And he, and he created Eve, not just because, not saying like, oh yeah, you need a spouse. No, he created for community. You're not, it is not good for be, to be alone. And you are not intended to live alone. Galatians 6, 2 says that we are called that to, to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That is the plan 
That is to fulfill the law of Christ. That is how it was intended. And so my, my challenge to you, if you're, if just, just think about it for a second. How are you supposed to, how is someone supposed to bear your burdens if no one even knows about them? That's the law of Christ. That's what Galatians 6 says. And some of you need to bear someone else's burdens. You will need to be the one that lifts them up, but you also need to let people in so they can know how they can lift you up. That's why community is our heart at Project Church. That's why you need to be in a group. Man, there's been more groups ever. I've been hearing stories. I'm in a group and I'm, I'm in experiencing the joy of community. And, and it's simply that. And you need to go after it. It's, community is your job. That's, that's, that's what this passage is highlighting is that, and you need to ask for it. And some of you, that's so outside of your comfort zone and you, you are, you have your personality. That's how God wired you. So do it your way. But I want to tell you, tell you, you need to invite others into your journey. You are not intended to, to figure out this pain on your own. Jesus, the son of God, fully God, fully man, invited community. He said, pray for me, Simon, pray for me, John, pray for me, James, I need you. I want to tell you, this is, this is the practical point. The other ones are deeper here. I'm going to tell you something a little bit more practical that I've done with a few guys in this church. And I have uh, someone that I do frequently too, is you have a conversation with someone that's going to bear your burdens and you're going to bear their burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, like Galatians 6 says. And, you'd, and, and this is so practical because you're like, what does that mean, bear one another's burdens? Here's what I believe is, is uh, just a tool in your tool, tool belt to have. When you feel overwhelmed, when you feel anxiety, when you feel like you're tempted, when you feel like you're, you're, you're the battle in your mind and you're losing it, you need to have someone in your corner that all you do is say, pray for me. You text them pray for me. And you don't have to explain it because often I've found that I, when I need prayer, I feel like I have to explain everything. And then I'm like, nah, I, I just don't want to. But having an understanding beforehand with somebody and just being able to say like, it could be big or small, doesn't matter. It doesn't, there's no judgment. There's no expectation to explain it. And that person stops. So I'll get a text every now and then from somebody and, and it'll just say, pray for me. And I'll, and if, unless I'm like in the middle of like preaching or doing something, I'll stop and pray for them. And how powerful is that? So I want to give you that tool as a takeaway. Find someone, have that conversation so you can bear one another's burden. Processing pain means inviting community into your journey. But here's, here's where it goes a little deeper. Processing pain means crying out to God. See, it, it doesn't mean sucking it up. I think I, I, I was taught that for a long time because I was, I was actually, I mean, I'm actually a very sensitive person and I, and I'm unashamed to say that and, and, and blow the stigma out of the water that men are supposed to suck it up and men can't be sensitive. Unashamedly, I will say that. And as a young boy, I, I was confused because I, I was sensitive. And sometimes I would start crying. I didn't actually know why. And then uh, my, my family didn't understand why either. So I, it made me feel really insecure. But I, what I want to tell you is emotions are created by God. Like sometimes we're like, man, I'm experiencing pain. I'm feeling these emotions and we're like, suck it up. God, God wants you to cry out to him. Like my, my daughters, they'll experience something. And, and what a joy. I have never like, stop. What a joy it is for my kids to run to me and just for me to embrace them. Your father in heaven wants you to run to him and cry out to God with all the pains, with not holding anything back. Jesus went to his father and said, Abba, father, Abba, father, take, if there's any other way, this is what I'm experiencing. Can I tell you, you need to be real with God. I used to feel like you had to be all polished up and you had to like have your life together before you go to God. You have to say the right words to God. I, man, I've been reading the Psalms and, I, and I'm just reminded how David, in the midst of such a hardship, in the midst of such an injustice, things were done to him that were not right. He did not cause them. He didn't deserve them. But it was a pain that he went through. And he was just crying out to God. And it wasn't pretty. It actually even wasn't even faith filled. It was God saying, how have you forsaken me? Which that, that's not biblical. That's not truth, but it's how he felt. And he was authentic and vulnerable with God. We need to be authentic and vulnerable to God. We need to, someone needs to know you don't need to suck it up. 
You don't need to ignore it. We don't need to suppress the, that pain that we've gone through. Acknowledge it and run to God. Pr- pr- uh, processing pain. Because you know what? He is the wonderful counselor. I'm absolutely in favor of going to a counselor because God uses people to help us process pain. But he is also, he is the wonderful counselor. That's what his name is, wonderful counselor. He comforts us and he will help you process pain better than anyone else in this world. He will help you process that pain and he comforts us. We have to be willing to be authentic and vulnerable with God. But here's the thing, it doesn't end there. Prayer involves crying out to God with your deepest pain, but it doesn't stop there because Jesus cried out with his deepest pain. He he distressed, up, sorrowful, almost to death. Like that, I I, I was studying the Greek on that concept. And there's even some like studies of showing how you can become so sorrowful you can die. And that's what he was experiencing. He was crying out to God with it. Deepest pain. But what I've made the mistake of is stopping there. Like, all right, I had my cry session with God and it was great. I feel comforted, but now I'm going to still do my own thing. But see, Jesus cried out to God and then he said, I know you you can do it all. I know you can take this cup from me that I wouldn't have to walk through this pain. But not my will, but your will be done. You see, processing pain means crying out to God, but it also means fully surrendering to him. See, when, when my daughter, she was, she, she was upset about something she had to do, a chore she had to do. And it felt like unfair. Sisters didn't have to do it. And like, it wasn't fair. And I comforted her. She was like really bothered by it. And also there was another a bunch of other emotional things going on in our house. I got, I got a house full of girls. So there's a lot of emotions in my house. Tell, tell me about emotions. I, I could talk to you about them. And so I comforted her and I was like, okay, what, help me understand what you go, what, what's going on. I'm making myself sound like an amazing dad, but I'm not like, always, I, was, I don't always have it together. Um, but I, this time I was like, okay, what's going on? And then, but at the end of it, I had to ask her, I was like, this doesn't mean you're, you're not going to do the thing. Like I'm comforting you, but you, I still expect you to walk through this. And so, so there's that crying out to God. And I think sometimes we're like crying out to God and be like, okay, now I don't have to do that. But we're crying out to God. And Jesus said, not my will, but your will. I'm still in. It may hurt. It may be the hardest thing I've ever had to do, but I'm still willing to walk through this. I still trust that you, that you're sovereign, God. I still trust you. And I'm still willing to say that, man, I'm surrendering control. That's what it is. I've had to learn that lesson pretty hard lately is surrendering control because I'm a planner, visa planner. And we get this picture of how we intend. It's our preferred future. Like this is how I, I see it going down. And I often I'm, I'm reminded is like, God, I, God says to me, hey, Lauren, I love how you plan her. I love how you plan some things, but are you willing to let those go? Like your preferred like picture of how you see your life going. That's great. I created you as an analytical person that plans, and that's great. But are you willing to fully surrender? And if things do not go the way you have in your mind, in your preferred future, are you willing to surrender that? Not my will, but your will. That's what processing pain means. That's what Jesus did. And here's the last thing. Processing pain means trusting God can work it out for our good and for the good of others. Let's talk about that. There's two parts to that for our good and for the good of others. It's a verse that we uh, talk about. One of the most like the the favorite verses, most memorized uh, Sunday school, all the things. Is Romans 8, 28, for in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him and are called to his purpose. And often we, we interpret scripture very selfishly. I don't know if you know that, but we have a selfish uh, perspective. It's like the guy who read the, the story of Noah and the ark. And it's like, hey, what well, was God speaking to you through that? And he's like, I think God wants me to have a yacht. It's like, no, nah, no, nah, bro, you missed it. That's not... 
I don't think that's it. Um, we read that passage and we're like, God works together for our good. He works it all together for our good. And I think the selfish perspective or just the skewed perspective, maybe it's the uninformed perspective, is what the good means. We think, man, I lost my job, so I'm getting a higher paying job. Maybe. We, I, I, I uh, wrecked my car, so I get a better car. Maybe. But that's not promised. I went through some stuff, but now I'm in a better circumstance. See, this promise isn't circumstantial. It's not exterior. It's not external. This promise is actually internal because what does the good mean? Well, in, in this verse, as Romans 8, 28, Paul was talking to the, to the Roman church and he was saying, he, it was in context to our intimacy with Christ. And this is grammatically incorrect, but there is nothing gooder. There is nothing greater. There is nothing gooder than our intimacy with Christ. You following me? So through the pain, what is promised, that you wrecked your car, that you lost your job, how God is promised, I can explain it to you. Every circumstance, despite the pain, is if it pushes you closer to God, then it is for your good because there is nothing better than knowing Christ deeper. And, and Jesus was experiencing something. That's why it was called the Gethsemane. That means it's an olive press. And there's a, the idea of Gethsemane means a, a pressing. And this idea that, that from the pressing, from the pain, something beautiful and something valuable. Olive, olive oil was so valuable. And that from the pressing, something beautiful is coming out of it. And that, that, that's for our good. So here's the part. Romans 8.28, this is talking about for our good. So through the pain, something God's working internally through you or in you, but also through you. You see, one of the most painful recent experiences um, that I've gone through, and I don't know, maybe up there, I don't, I don't know how you rank them, but maybe it's because it's been in the last three or four years, is, man, I loved, we, we had such an incredible journey in West Sacramento launching the church, and we saw people saved, we saw people baptized, we saw, I saw people elevate, I saw my faith grow, my wife's faith grow, I saw our family grow, I saw people just stepping into their to their gifts, the people that were far from God were now being used by God, and I started celebrating that, but there was a season when I didn't see that happening, it felt like we were losing steam, and it was actually so painful because I realized I was attaching my identity to the success of the church. And so it feels great, you know, when you're like, man, this is going really good, then I feel really great. But what if things stop going really good? Then I don't feel very great. And I started feeling very not great. And I, and I didn't know how to do it. And it was a painful process that I was working through, trying to figure out what was going on. And I was not, don't have the time to describe how little I felt because I felt like, man, I'm a failure. Like I, I don't have what it takes and that, that stings. And I can talk about that without any weirdness or out with, without any shame because I'm so grateful that happened because in the midst of my pain, I was crying out to God and it wasn't pretty. It wasn't a simple formula. I don't want this to sound like it's just a simple formula. It's complex. It's messy. So don't feel like it's, it's, it's easy. But in the midst of my pain and crying out to God, he revealed to me a truth that I preached, but I didn't live it. That my security is not in, my, in what I can do. My identity is not in what I can do. He says, Lauren, I don't love you anymore or any less based on how good you do stuff for me. I love you because you're my son. I know who we were singing that song. I love you because you're my son. And, and all of a sudden, the itch, a weight just lifted off of me. I was so psyched out of my mind. I'm like, Jesus loves me. It doesn't matter. Like I started flipping the script on the devil because he was holding it over my head and being like, yo, you, you don't have what it takes. And I was, I was legit. I don't talk to the devil a lot, but I told him, I'm like, yo, the whole church could crash and burn. I could be the biggest failure in history as a pastor. Like I legit don't care because that doesn't matter like the thing that matters most I don't wish that on me I don't wish that on anybody and I'm but I'm not afraid of that because the thing that matters most the devil can't touch 
And so that was the good work that happened in me. And what happens in you will overflow to out of you. So God wants to work in you for your good, the good, works things out for good in you, but also through you for other people. See, Jesus going to the cross, he was able to experience the pain because he saw the purpose through it. The greatest act ever done, the greatest sacrifice that you and I are all experiencing right now is the freedom that we have in Christ. The ability to have fellowship with God is because he went to the cross. The payment for sin was taken upon that cross. And that was a hefty payment that he, that Jesus paid for us. But he did it because he knew there was purpose on the other side. See, some of us have walked through some painful things. And, I'm, and this is the word that I want to encourage you with. You look back and you say, I wish that never happened. That painful thing that, that you have experienced and you look back and you say, I wish that never happened. God wants to rewrite the language you use. He wants to change the perspective that you look back on the painful things. Just like Joseph lived his life and he was injustice after injustice, things done to him, wrongfully done. He was thrown into a well. He was sold into slavery. He was wrongfully accused of adultery. He was thrown into prison. But at the end of his life, God kept on giving him favor. God kept on giving him favor. Through the pain, God was working. And at the end of his life, he sees his brothers who were the ones that sold him into slavery. And he brings about the greatest healing. He stops the famine. There's so many things in that. But but Joseph said the words that this was meant for evil against me. But God meant it for good. I want to tell you today that the things, the injustices that were done, the things that that you did not deserve, that hurt so deep, you're going to look back on those things and say, I see how that was evil. And that was, I'm not trying to tell you that it wasn't, it wasn't that big of a deal. That was a huge deal. Whatever the painful thing that's coming up for you right now. But you're going to look back and you say, I see how it was meant for evil. But we serve a God that takes the things that were meant for evil and he turns it for good. See, scripture says that we are comforted. 1 Corinthians 3, 5, 3. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5. That we are comforted so that we can comfort others. That we experience the God of all comfort. And you go to the next verse, verse 4. Who comforts us in our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in the affliction. See, you've gone through a pain so that God can do a work inside you. And so you can also bring people through that same pain that you've walked through. Someone needs you. There is a purpose to your pain. There is a reason you've walked through some hard things and you're walking through some hard things. And it's because... He wants to use that for his good. He's going to help you depend on him more. But he's also going to use that to bless the world. He's going to use that to bless the world. I have, I have something heavy on my heart, but I just want us to close or to bow our heads and close our eyes in an honest moment of response. I want to ask you, what would it look like if you became honest with God? What would it look like if you cried out to him, if you surrendered to him and you allowed him to help you process your pain. I believe God wants to do something here in this room right now. He wants to heal. He wants to comfort. He wants to be the wonderful counselor. So Lord, have your way in this place. God, we surrender to you. I see a church that is hungry. I see a church that is unashamed, that is, that is so desperate for you that we're willing to walk through the painful things. And God, I just sense You turning things around. God, redeeming the painful things for your purpose. And and if that's you and, and you're in this place and you just say, I want Jesus to come into my space. I want Jesus to be with me as I walk through this pain. I want to know he has a purpose. I need to let this, to let God work through me in this. I need him to counsel and to comfort me. And this message is for you. I just want to know who I can pray for. Just put your hand up on the count of three. One, two, three. I just want to know who I'm praying for. Yes, yes, yes. Hands going up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You can put it down. And the second group of people with every head bowed, I just want you to know if this is, if you're here and you do not know Jesus and you don't know what it means to follow him, or maybe you did and you walked away and you just want a relationship with Jesus. You want to experience a relationship with him because of the price he paid. See, that's the thing we're talking about, pain. He went through pain so that we could be comforted in our pain. 
and that we can have right relationship with him. And if that's you, this is what we're all about as a church is finding life and freedom in Jesus. If you're in this place and you want to know him personally, you just put your hand up on the count of three. One, two, three. Just put it up. Thank you. One, two, three, four, five. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Put it up. Put it right back down. Thank you so much. Six. I see you in the back. Thank you so much. Six hands. Come on. Come on. Would you, would you all pray this? Everybody in the room say, Jesus, I need you. Come into my life. Make me new. Forgive me of my sin. Give me strength to live for you. Come into my life. Heal my pain. Help me to walk through my pain. Use it for your purpose. Use me for your purpose. Heal my heart. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to invite my wife. Where, yes, come on. Celebrate. Celebrate. We're going we're gonna to have the prayer team come up. But I wanted uh, my wife to share something on her heart. Yeah, uh, this week as I was just praying over this day, knowing what he was going to talk about. Uh, and I'm not going to add any teaching to it because it was phenomenal but I really just felt like God had a word for two groups of people here today and the first group is for those of you that without recognizing it or maybe you do you've attached your pain to your identity that maybe what happened to you or the decisions that you've made that have caused this pain whether traumatic you've attached that as that's who you are that you are that pain. And God just wants to say to you that you are not that pain. That he has created you to be his. That you are victorious. That you are his child. And with that comes inheritance. That you are royalty. And you need to remove that pain as your identity. And you need to stand tall and strong in the identity that God has placed upon you. Remove that pain as your identity. And the second group of people that I feel like God just wanted this word is for a group of people who, or maybe it's just one person, that you said, I've heard all this before. I know God wants to take this and use it for his glory and use it for my glory, but I don't see it. And I've been waiting, and I've been waiting, and I've been waiting. And I just feel God say to you that he has you. He says, rest in me. Hide in the shadow of his wings. And even though it may be uncomfortable, and I know the pain of feeling hidden, it was many years, but he is faithful. He is faithful. So stay in that waiting. Rest in him. And don't let that pain harden you. Because he's going to use it in a great way. Yeah. We're going to sing this song. Would you stand to our feet? Stand, let's all stand to our feet. Jesus, we love you. Let's just sing this out. Cry out to him. He's healing us. He's working. Jesus, we love you.
I think that there's something that happens when we take a step up here that God meets us. And um, Lawrence, Pastor Lawrence said it. You can't go through pain alone. It's already defeating enough, isn't it? And I think that today the Lord wants to begin to heal hearts. I think he wants to give people that have walked in completely hopeless a chance to leave this place today with more hope in their hearts than they walked in with. And I think that that's what happens when we respond. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that. But before you leave, if that's not you, um, I don't know how many more of these books we got. They're going quickly. Um, $10 out there in the lobby. You can follow us along in the 40 days of decrease. We're posting on social media. We're diving and doing a study together. As we're getting ready for Good Friday where Jesus is crucified and Easter three days later. So these are powerful. We're going through this as a church. If you have not gotten yours, make sure you stop out there and get it. But listen, if you need to respond, if you need to come forward, don't, don't leave. Don't go through those back doors without coming up here and letting God speak to you. Hey, we love you, Project. Have an amazing week. We'll see you next Sunday. And believing as Easter comes, the best is yet to come. Amen? Amen. Love you guys.